Hello, we're like Web. I'm Dr. Shadow, the internet personality, who is really behind on this whole clown theme review special for March. So, uh, let's fix that. The original plan was to review not only Drive Through, All Hallows Eve, and Terrifier, but three more movies every Wednesday in March for March of the Clowns. Not exactly the best plan we think about it, considering that's six movies and there's only five Wednesdays in March, but let's fix that right quick by reviewing all three remaining movies right now in a row. A triple feature review! And like many a horror anthology, that means I'm not going to spend nearly as much time on each film. But it's alright, the movies in question are Mr. Jingles, Jingles the Clown, and Clown Town. So not exactly the most deep or intricate plots Anyway, but nevertheless, uh, internet attention spans are at an all-time low, so let's get this show started with Mr. Jingles. Not to be confused with the American Horror Story episode of the same name, this Mr. Jingles was released straight to video in 2006. Mr. Jingles is an incredibly low-budget indie horror flick seemingly recorded straight to video as well. It follows the tale of a clown and, get this, he's named Mr. Jingles, and he kills people. Which is still actually better than the American Horror Story episode. It was just a generic Jason ripoff that happens to take place at a summer camp, and this guy has a key ring. And I guess it jingles sometimes, so... Anyway, let's take a look at Mr. Jingles. Because we got a lot to cover here. We open up to Mr. Jingles murdering a woman. Or she just dropped her syrup-coated sausage on the floor as her waist is clearly fine. Mr. Jingles is played by Rudy Hatfield and is busy murdering the entire Randall family. The mother, the father, and of course, Angie, their daughter. And yeah, the spooky spooky sound that Mr. Jingles makes as he's sneakily stalking around the place looking for victims is jingle bells. Like Christmas jingle bells. My uh Public domain sound effect Christmas jingle bells. Not particularly well mixed public domain sound effect Christmas jingle bells. So it's just as well that the police, hearing the screams, barge in and mow the clown down in short order. This saves Angie's life, allowing her to grow up to be played by Kelly Jensen. She's been in an asylum ever since, but now, years later, is going home. Though she still suffers nightmares about the clown. He was trying to say something, but I couldn't hear him. The bells were too loud. Wait, so is the shitty sound mix actually integral to the plot? Dr. Rudolph said <laughs> this might trigger some memories. <laughs> Dr. Rudolph, god damn, this movie has enough of an unnecessary Christmas vibe to it. Either way, they bring Angie to Heidi's home and Angie's new home, where she meets her new little brother, Dylan, played by Nathaniel Ketchum. Unfortunately, he's one of those alternative kids and has a bit of an obsession with Jingles the Clown, the local serial killer legend. But he has a soft spot. Meeting Angie and seeing how happy she is has made him reconsider previous plans about unspecified jingles-related shenanigans. However, his girlfriend Melanie, played by Heather Daba, refuses to allow him to reconsider. Their argument is further interrupted by Melanie's father, Bill, played by Chris Peters, who happens to be the former police officer who shot Mr. Jingles. Man, small world. Never mind any of that for now, though. We have to watch a man berate his dead relatives at the cemetery for no apparent reason. Who's there? You know, I probably could have reviewed this as a Christmas-themed horror movie, and people would have been none the wiser. Now, it has as much to do with that as it does clowns at this point. Clowns who attack and murder this man! Or throw blood on him between takes. Either way, while this is going on, Heidi is spilling the beans on the fact that her and her mother were planning a surprise birthday party for Angie. A very loose definition of surprise, I suppose. There are far more surprises going on around with the police anyway. Hello? How'd you get this number? Oh my god. Yeah, phone books. They exist. Seems you just can't murder someone in broad daylight in this town without SOMEONE taking note. But not our party-planning protagonists, of course, who think inviting some hot guys over would be totes amaze. But Heidi is worried her mother won't allow it. Well, maybe she should join the party. Hooking up with a hot young stud might change her opinion. <laughs> might change your mind once Mom's on her fourth, fifth, and is dancing topless on the kitchen table, while all the hot young studs you invited over are all passed out in limp dicts. These teens have no idea just how much their parents have partied and how well they can hold their alcohol. 
While they planned the party, the ne'er-do-wells planned to crash the party by getting the headstone of Mr. Jingles from the cemetery. But before they can, they notice the police are there, along with a stranger played by John Anton. Seems he's well-versed on the plot of this movie and is very angry about it. He escaped to take his revenge. Revenge for what? Stay the fuck back! Revenge for what? Jeez, I haven't seen someone so violently defend their personal space since... Oh yeah, my fiancé's cat, Dobby. But hey, Mr. Jingles was caught trying to abduct Angie way back when, and the townspeople beat the crap out of him and locked him away. But whoopsie, the truth was he was in fact saving her from an actual child predator at the time and was wrongfully accused. So after getting out of prison, he went to murder those who wronged him. Anyway, back with party planning, seems something's come up and Angie's auntie can't stay. But they can have a party if they promise no boys. The little gang also is still working on their preparations. Dylan and the lady head back, while the two extra kids stuck around for the headstone. Also, our little stranger has another trick for taking on Jingles, which he intends to tell Bill. Later, first we gotta watch what happens to the two guys. Knock it off, jackhole. I'm not falling for it. Oh, wow! The pair that felt like they were extras who just forgot you're not supposed to stand in the foreground of the shots happened to be killed off in the middle of the movie. Man, what a roller coaster ride of emotions that was. As the other is killed off even faster. Anyway, back with our crazy stranger man, he explains to Bill that during Mr. Jingle's time in prison, he was actually studying really hard in black magic and learned how to bring himself back from the dead, a spell which he cast the day that Bill killed him. Amazing what you could do by editing in shots that weren't in the original scene. Don't worry, there is a way to kill the unkillable. Remember, when he's in the house, you have to place those candles in all four corners, then he's trapped. How about I just get my gun? It works for Doom Guy anyway. But the stranger has a better idea. A mystically enchanted knife. <laughs> oh shit, well now's your chance. Well, for a long time, Billy Boy, I was just hanging. <laughs> Even a bridge to hell, this scene still felt like a big waste of fucking time. Well, it's time for Angie's welcome back slash birthday party, which means they invited all the guys. Dylan is still snooping around outside with Melanie, but does he still have the drive to pull off the prank? God damn it. So he heads into the party while Melanie prepares her costume in the backyard, which means she's all alone. Therefore, surprise, curly girl. <laughs> Look what Mr. Jingles has for you. Oh, you mean they killed the heartless bitch with zero redeeming qualities? Man, I am in shock. You can guess how the next 15 minutes of climax go. Every time the camera changes, the body count rises to silly-ass jingle bells. And Mr. Jingle's prosthetic mouth now muffles his dialogue pretty heavily. By the end of it all, everyone is dead. Killed by Mr. Jingles. Everyone, that is. Except for Angie. So when the police arrive... Freeze! Uh, so Angie really was insane and she killed everyone? Well, I guess this only reignites the Mr. Jingles legend. That's exactly what I'm counting on! Hello, fuckers! <laughs> uh, no, 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 she didn't. He's, he's real and he, he, he let her live. Why? Reignite the legend? That would be a lot more convincing if he did just kill her and then, hey, no one can possibly think she did it because she's dead. And now who's left? Oh, wait, nobody. That means the only option is, hey, that legend of Mr. Jingles. That'd do a lot better of a job. Come on, we gotta go. She's never gonna stop, is he? Come with me if you wanna live. Oh, even better, Bill survived somehow and they run off to do something. Don't ask me what, the sequel's actually a reboot. Wow, Mr. Jingles, that was, uh, well, they tried. 
It's pretty obvious that the people who made this were very much amateurs, as the acting, writing, pacing, and quality of the video was pretty low end. But there are things to appreciate in Mr. Jingles. Strangely enough, while the editing is kind of jumpy and the audio mixing doesn't help, there is a clear knowledge of cinematography on display here. You have decent framing and choice of angles, close-ups where characters talk on the phone while the paper they're referencing is reflected in their glasses. Honestly, well done stuff here. Just too bad that's about the only positive thing I have to say about Mr. Jingles. Coming in at one, axe to the forehead, out of five. And a high one, but let's not dwell on it. Let's move on to the sequel, Jingles the Clown. Released in 2009, Jingles the Clown is written by Tommy Brunswick and directed by Todd Brunswick, the same Brunswicks who did Mr. Jingles, and it's pretty clear they have honed their craft in the three years between movies. This time, the story follows a TV show pilot searching for supernatural signs in the legendary home of fabled serial killer Mr. Jingles. The same, but different. Much different. So, let's take a look at Jingles the Clown and see how much better they did. I mean, it can only go up from there. In this universe, Jingles the Clown isn't a birthday clown, but a television clown on the Crackers and Jingles show. That's enough backstory, it's time to get into the murdering history of the clown. Now played by the stranger from the last film, John Anton. He's beating a woman to death and impaling a man right in front of their children. But, of course, the police show up, meaning it's only time to murder one of the little tykes before doing everything he can to evade the police. Which only gets him beaten up, dragged off, and... Holy shit! Oh, fuck, I'm sorry, I thought I was holding his Miranda rights. Ah, well, just gotta dump the body now. That winks at Angie, and after the cart sent to dispose of Jingles doesn't call back, a squad goes to investigate, discovering the officers murdered and the body missing. Following the trail of blood, it leads to an old septic tank. Which, they figure, eh, he probably fell down there. Good enough. And we move on to meeting our characters, the cast of Haunted Maniacs, a new show in the vein of Ghost Hunters. Not enough time to cover everyone, but the guy who looks like the best I can do with most games create a character systems trying to look like myself is JB, played by Tevin R. Markham. He's stoked that Miranda, played by Virginia Brandt, has managed to get the Jingles house for their pilot and Angie Nelson, the sole survivor, as a special guest. What's going on in the house right now, though, is a couple of random teenagers about to get killed. Jeez, first Resident Evil, now this. Where the hell do I have to go for my razor-sharp shovel sharpening services? When JB and company arrive, they find the bloody blanket left behind, but eh, the show must go on. The rest of the crew arrives shortly after, made up mostly of psychics with different names, but they also have Angie in tow, played by April Canning. I'm just not good with people. Okay, I, I understand completely. No, you don't. Who really hasn't gotten over her tragedy. I feel like it's really easy to spot the traumatized character written by someone who probably hasn't faced anything nearly that bad because for some reason they're always sitting in the corner shaking, unable to cope with anything in life. Writers, writers, people do get better. They do learn to live just like anyone else. And you would never know that they suffered trauma. We sometimes use humor to cope. It's called gallows humor. The crew enters the house and wastes no time setting up all their equipment. Also, the resident medium lets them know that he's hearing a lot of voices, feels tons of negative energy, and is hearing a warning. It's a warning to you, Angela. Well, so much for the pilot episode. You still have a teaser. Just a reminder, Angie is really fucked up because of her really fucked up past and all the horrible things Mr. Jingles did to her family right in front of her! But, yeah, more important than that, she really needs this paycheck, so fuck it. She's staying around anyway. And stay around she does. This part of the movie is pretty much just stopping to go over the history of Mr. Jingles, which kind of already saw, and all the spooky, spooky things about this house and how this is totally, really scary! We also run out of Jingles lore to fill out the running time, so the medium decides to tell a story about how he kinda, sorta, accidentally got his brother killed in a horrible ice lake accident, and now his brother is his spirit guide. Also, gotta step out for a smoke break. <laughs> Oh, 
Well, I guess his brother also still holds a grudge against him for that. As none of the spirits decide to warn the poor bastard about the murderous clown now murdering him! The handy-dandy psychic feels this, but not soon enough to stop it. When he tells everyone, they decide it's time to escape this house, so they run outside! Meeting a random new character with some new insights. If your friend is missing, we should be inside. Really? Man, we just stepped out and got some fresh air. So they run inside! Turns out this is the caretaker of the property, and oh yeah, there is a slight problem with missing persons cases happening around this house. Probably should have mentioned that before now. With that being the case, they must run outside to the cars where they can flee! No surprises here, the cars don't work, so they must run back inside! Spare the caretaker who is going to go find help, but this is taking a while and he hasn't returned, so they must run outside where they find dead bodies, as well as Mr. Jingles. So they must run inside and argue about the energy, its connection to Angela, the fact that several people are dead, and what they can do to survive the clown. But then... <laughs> Uh, guys? Is anyone gonna point a camera at that? You are still technically filming the first episode of a ghost hunting TV show, and that's the clearest fucking evidence we've ever seen in the entire history of the world. Someone point a 4K camera at the damn thing! Nah, we're just gonna completely forget the TV show angle entirely from here on out. This is Angie's sister, who says that the clown is, of course, versed in occult magic, immortal, enslaves the souls of his victims, all that jazz. There is a way to defeat him, but more importantly, everyone else can escape if they all do it right now, but Angie stays behind. Which, of course, they don't do, instead arguing about meaningless drivel long enough for the window of opportunity to be closed, and the clown to kill them all, one by one, electrocuting Sam, stabbing... Uh, well, even if I wasn't doing a quickfire review, I wouldn't remember this guy's name, and generally making the night even harder for them. But what about the way to defeat Jingles? Whoever has the talisman has the power. We have to find it. It turns out all of his evil immortality magics are tied to a specific talisman, and if you destroy that talisman, you can kill the clown. Guess what no one's gonna do this fucking movie? They figure it's in the attic, and therefore, Jingles murders Miranda, snaps my creative character's neck, and this knocks Angie out, who awakens sometime later to find the last spare character tied up to be tortured to death by Mr. Jingles in front of her. Not only that, it's time for a shocking revelation! It turns out that Angie's mother was fucking Mr. Jingles! This means Angela is in fact Mr. Jingles' daughter! This changes... Just about nothing! Spare retconning that Angie evidently killed animals as a kid, and we never saw that scene, and sacrificed her sister to save herself, which we also had no hint of until now. No bother, Angie can break free, and realizing the clown doll is the talisman, she threatens Mr. Jingles, before stabbing him in the throat with a screwdriver, killing him! Then she just... leaves, carrying the doll. I mean, we established she knows she has to destroy it, but for some reason, she just didn't. I guess if she did, we couldn't end the movie like this. <laughs> he's alive! He's him! He's alive! Yeah, well, whose fucking fault is that? Anyway, that was Jingles the Clown. It's better, but, I mean, let's be honest, that wasn't hard to do. Compared to Mr. Jingles, Jingles the Clown wins in at least looking like it was made by people who make movies for a living. There is an attempt at writing nuanced characters, and having a kind of narrative thread to work with, but unfortunately things do fall apart in many regards. For starters, acting is all over the place. There is never a single line the psychic says that doesn't sound like someone doing a high school play suffering from terrible stage fright. The mountain of shocking twists at the end that really don't matter. They don't explain anything leading up to now and have no payoff going forward. And let's not forget the TV show angle to get the movie started, only to be forgotten completely after a certain point. Like the events in the house were thought up first and the TV show angle was put in later to try and explain how they got there. At the end of the day, Jingles the Clown is at least watchable. It's got some entertaining value to it, but it still only is really going to appeal to fans of cheesy horror. Coming in at two, totems you knew you had to destroy, why didn't you? Out of five. Really could have been better, but as we all saw moments earlier, it could have easily been much, much worse. So let's finish this trilogy of tales of turbulent terror of theaters of... Clown Town.
The newest movie on the list, this one came out in 2016, and also has absolutely nothing to do with the two previous movies. I just, uh, bought it to review for March of the Clowns, and now we're here, so let's take a look at Clown Town. Okay, let's just hold up one motherfucking second. Okay. Based on true events, I'm sure a lot of you out there are wondering exactly what true events inspired this movie. You remember all those clowns that just kind of popped up and no one knew what the hell was going on in 2014? Yeah, that. Just that there happened to be clowns at some point, and no one knew why. As you can see, that's quite a stretch for this. We open to a babysitter slash swimwear enthusiast reading a bedtime story for the Strode children. Yeah, we all know what that's based on. Nevertheless, news comes of a horrifying train accident that has rocked the town. No time for that, though. There's strange noises, and the boy is dressed like a clown. He runs off, though, so she can slowly sneak around all suspenseful-like. And this can happen. Okay, so has, has, has the body count started, or does a train derailment count? Either way, we fast forward decades later and meet the actual main characters for this story. Our main guy with the least convincing acting, Brad, played by Brian Nagel. The silent Bob-looking motherfucker Mike, played by Andrew Statton. Brad's main squeeze, Sarah, played by Lauren Compton. And Mike's lady, Jill, played by Katie Keene. They're heading to a concert, but can't quite find the way. No worries, the local sheriff, played by Christopher Lawrence Chapman, gives them some directions. I just wouldn't screw around any of those small towns, though. It's pretty easy to get sidetracked. Yeah, but then we wouldn't have a movie now, would we? Continuing on, they realize that they're running low on gas, but even worse. Jill realizes that she can't search for one on GPS because she can't find her phone! Figuring they accidentally left it at the diner, they call it up and the person who answers tells them to meet up with him at a town just up the road. However, when they get there, not only do they not see the person in question, they don't see a soul whatsoever. The entire town looks completely deserted. They're waiting for the so-called Good Samaritan takes so long. We stop to watch a completely different pair of characters stop on the road to pee and argue, which is important to the plot later. Ah oh, well, no help no matter how long they wait, so they decide, fuck it, let's just leave. But they can't. We are not going anywhere like this. What do you mean? I don't know. What do you think? I think you should have waited by the car. Spotting weird people in the alleyways, Mike asks for help, but they Batman vanish on the group, so they just wander on through the night until they find aggressive-looking clowns. This is so scary, they don't notice the truck that almost runs them down. Quickly explaining, no, their cell phones are dead, too. We find out it's not just their phones they have to worry about being dead in this town. As the clown beats him to death in the streets. Surrounded by quite a few people who, if they worked together, could easily save him, but... Eh, the movie will be over too fast that way. They just watch him die, get surrounded by more clowns, and run for their lives! Eventually finding their way to a junkyard, and looking for somewhere to hide. Okay, let's go. Ah yes, but before Jill can follow, she is grabbed by the big hulking clown who is hiding just out of frame. They notice immediately, but can't do much about it as when they try to hide in the Winnebago, the clowns besiege it from all sides. No, wait, scratch one side, where homeless Santa Claus comes to save the day! This would be Frank, played by Greg Violand. He does everything he can to help, from showing them the way to safety, to overacting to make up for Brian's underacting. We need to go inside now! Is this what happened to Dr. Light after Capcom stopped making Mega Man games? He says he knows where they can find Jill, but isn't talking before eating. We are also shown that Jill is still alive! The lady clown, the only one who talks, is using her as a sort of living doll at the moment. Anyhow, Frank decides to dump some exposition. Seems the train being derailed did a number on the town, really fucked up the economy. Jobs left, as did people, but also, hey! People started dying! And there was a clown problem all of a sudden! They just, you know, kill people. Clowns own this town now. I heard rumors of clowns in this town, but I thought it was bullshit to scare people. Well, that's all well and good, but we kind of already know that there are clowns out there killing people, and we still don't know why. And yes, that is kind of important. 
Before they can get to explaining where Jill is, though, the safe house is attacked by clowns! Spare character is taken out, and the rest must run! Making it to the roof, eventually one of them attacks Sarah, and Brad must save her! Then Sarah must save him! Get up! I said get up! No, 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 we've been through this! You don't let the psycho killer get back up! You take your chance to kill them, and do it! Yeah! Like that! That taken care of, Frank tells them he'll write down the directions to Jill, and looky here! The spare character's handy-dandy truck is still on the road, and the clowns completely forgot to sabotage it this time. But what's this? It seems Frank is injured, and Brad is one of those stupid horror characters stopping to see if he's okay with that knife in the chest and all. Oh, would you look at that? They were waiting to ambush the group. What a surprise. As Sarah and Mike are trapped in the car, Brad makes the command decision to say fuck it and leave them to run off on their own and fend for themselves. This leads to him discovering the house of Mrs. Strode. Her mental faculties have clearly seen better days. Or have they? She explains that on that fateful movie introduction years ago, it was in fact her who killed the babysitter because her children were clowns in making and that's somehow... Okay, I still have no fucking idea why or how they all became crazy clowns. Now, oh, well, back with Mike and Sarah, they sneakily stealth their way through the streets at night, stopping on the patch of wall marked for the movie, and observing that there is a garbage truck the clowns are using. That would be the perfect vehicle for them to hop in. Except they don't have the keys and get kidnapped in short order. That brings them right to Jill. Now we can see this happen. <laughs> Yep, kept her alive all movie just to make sure the other characters witnessed them killing her. I mean, they can't have some asshole on the internet like, Oh, are you sure she's dead? Did they see the body? But it turns out the sheriff was in cahoots with the clowns this whole time! Ish. He, he's somehow upset about the killing part, as if he didn't know that's what they've been doing for years. So they killed him! Man, what a twist that was. Oh well, Brad has made it to the party, and unties Sarah, but only half unties Bill. He's gotta show how badass he is, fighting off the clowns while still half tied up with nails through the hands. Unfortunately, that only gives him just enough strength to take out some clowns before dying, while our hero, Brad, drives the garbage truck off into the sunset with Sarah to maybe finally go to the concert. But ooh, the clown's still there! So what? Why? We still don't know. And when you establish that half the town just decided to start painting their faces and murdering people, why is kind of important there? Anyway, that was Clown Town. It's not that great, but... I mean, compared to Mr. Jingles, it's a fucking masterpiece. This is structured much more like your standard horror movie, with establishing shots and a concept of pacing, but it's still not exactly a great film, mainly because there's no rhyme or reason to it. Sure, there's the obvious why are people dressing up like clowns and killing people, but there's the even more pressing why is everyone else in town just going along with it? Why are the police in cahoots, or at least just as okay as everyone else with it? Why was the mother the killer? Well, that's probably a Friday the 13th reference, but what the hell did the train have to do with anything? These questions hurt even more when you consider that a good chunk of the movie is spent on exposition and talking about the tales of the clowns and the people who were there when it all started, but nah, let's just leave it totally mysterious. Yeah, that's why the real event was scary, because no one knew what was up with the clowns, but they weren't going around kidnapping and murdering people or taking over entire cities while the police covered for them. At the end of the day, Clown Town is an adequate horror flick. It's got a decent presentation with semi-likable characters and an interesting theme that is never really explored, but... Still, the whole thing is entertaining enough for what it is, coming in at three industrial-sized barrels of face paint out of five. And with that, the March of the Clowns is finally over. Ah, mm, do you smell that? It smells like more varied movies going forward. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you all for watching. I've been Decker Shadow. And remember, Month-long movie review specials are only supposed to last a month.
Oh my god. <laughs> 